I'm Diane Lewis. I'm the EVP and Chief Programming Officer for the Paley Center for Media, and it's really my great pleasure to welcome you to our Paley Impact discussion tonight. Finding Common Ground Through Storytelling, Ken Burns and PBS's Paula Kerger in Conversation. First, I'd like to thank the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. They have been truly an amazing partner, and we are extremely appreciative for all of their support in making meaningful programs like this evening's possible. And we'd also like to thank PBS and Joe DePlasco for all of their efforts in making this special event happen. And just before we get started, just hold on for one sec. You may want to get out your calendars as we have some tremendous events going on. Our annual holiday tradition, Paleyland, which promises an unforgettable experience for visitors of all ages, is happening now throughout all five floors of the Paley Museum. First, from our, our beloved Paley Express holiday train display to an enchanted tour through Santa's workshop to visits and photo ops with Santa, meet and greets with the iconic holiday characters, and everyone's favorite holiday special screen right here on the big screen. So there's so much to enjoy at this winter wonderland, and we hope that you will see it upstairs and come back and visit. Paley members receive early VIP presale, ticket discounts, and other exclusive benefits. We invite each of you to become a member if you're not already, and to join our special community. You can speak with one of our membership specialists as you exit the theater or upstairs in the lobby, or join online at paleycenter.org. Now, on to our program. Hailed as one of the preeminent documentarians of our time, as well as one of the most influential filmmakers in history, for almost 50 years, Ken Burns has been fostering a deeper understanding of American culture through his work. From his early films, such as Brooklyn Bridge and The Civil War, to his most recent The American Buffalo, Ken has showed us a profound way to view our collective past. His work has often reshaped how we interpret history, and reaffirm the significance of storytelling, and preserving our nation's cultured heritage in media. Ken Burns' films have been honored with dozens of awards, including 16 Emmy Awards, two Grammy Awards, and two Oscar nominations. Ken's honors also include a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Sciences and in November of, of 2022, Ken was inducted into the Television Academy Hall of Fame. His 2022 series, The U.S. and the Holocaust, is currently a finalist for the 2024 DuPont Columbia Award. Ken will join Paula Kerger, the longest serving president and CEO in PBS history, to discuss the ways storytelling and media can foster a deeper understanding of American culture and history, and how the power of compelling storytelling can bridge the divides within our nation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Paula has been honored with the Giants of Broadcasting Award, the Advancing American Democracy Award from the Benjamin Harris Presidential Site, and she is regularly featured in Washingtonian Magazine's Most Powerful Women in Washington. Ken has had a long and successful partnership with PBS, which Paula has helped to transform into a multi-platform digital media organization. Both Ken and Paula have ushered in a new era for public television while preserving its essential mission of education, inspiration, and service to the American public. And we are truly honored to have them both on the Paley stage with us this evening. Moderating tonight's conversation is Steve Pataglio. Stephen is a staff writer for the Los Angeles Times, as well as a book author and a television historian, specialized in the television news business and trends in the changing media landscape. He has also written about television and radio for the New York Times, Fortune, the New York Daily News, and Adweek. So please join me now in welcoming Stephen to the stage. Hi. Thank you. Good to see Good you. To see you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, uh, we can't, uh, I'm going to repeat a little bit here what, uh, what Diane said, but you know, Paula Kerger has been the chief executive officer of PBS since 2006, 
And that's longer than anyone, any executive in the system's history. And she's also probably outlasted a few uh, media platforms as well. I mean, her, her tenure has, has spanned, a, 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 I can't tell you, her tenure has, has just spent a massive disruption in the media industry. And over that time, she maintained the quality that PBS has stood for, but she's also innovated uh, to meet the demands of the consumer and, uh, and, the, and the technology. That's really changed the way we watch television. You know, it's, a, it's such a fragmented TV universe. PBS programming is watched, it still reaches, excuse me, still reaches 42 million people a month on traditional TV or linear television, as we call it. And 15 million people are watching on PBS own streaming platforms. And that's because Paul has guided the service into the digital era and hopefully beyond. So uh, let's give a big welcome to Paula Kerger. Okay, well, thank you for that. Wow. Thank you. Now, uh, Americans uh, have been binge watching Ken Burns before there even was such a thing. I mean, if you were to sit down and watch all of Ken's work continuously around the clock, it would take you two full weeks, I am told. And that would be two weeks extremely well spent. Uh, the late historian Stephen Ambrose said, more Americans get their history from Ken than any other source. <laughs> and that was true, unlike, the, unlike when ABC News was saying it. Uh, base, baseball, the Civil War, jazz, the Central Park Five, country music, the US and the Holocaust, Muhammad Ali, the American Buffalo, just a few of the reasons. He is among the most influential filmmakers of all time. But fortunately, there's a lot more to come. Leonardo da Vinci, the American Revolution, LBJ and the Great Society. Good stuff on its way. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Ken Burns. Come on. This is a crowd that knows their stuff. You can tell just by the way stuff. they're applauding. <laughs> Paula, I remember an Atlantic Magazine cover in the 1990s that attempted to make the case that public TV was no longer necessary, obsolete. Cable has given us everything we wanted. It was growing, and at the time, cable was growing. Now it's in decline. But now I imagine you hear the same <laughs> thing with streaming, where there's an infinite number of choices. Uh, where, uh, where, in this media landscape, we have more of everything, perhaps too much of everything. What makes PBS a necessity? Well, a and is it more challenging to keep it distinctive? Well, the abundance, uh, you know, you can unpack this question a few different ways. I mean, going back to the uh, argument during the blossoming of cable that PBS was irrelevant, there were a lot of channels that popped up that were based on where we're created as the commercial version of public broadcasting. No one remembers TLC actually stood for the Learning Channel. Um, or that Bravo was a- Or that Bravo was, a, was, was for a, the arts. It was a high-end culture. High-end culture yes. and, and the and arts. And a &E actually stands for arts, arts and, entertainment. and entertainment. So, um, and look, I, I think that um, all of those channels started with a sort of an earnest purpose that they were going to bring the kind of programming that people saw on PBS. but. The business imperative is, is a little different than what drives us. I always say that we use the same tools. We're just in a profoundly different business. Our, our, our goal ultimately is not to derive uh, a, a bottom line for investors. It's our investors are the people that live in every community across the country. And so to figure out what people need and to try to bring that great work forward I mean, when we were created, when LBJ had this bold idea of creating a public broadcasting service, he recognized, and remember, he came out of the media business, and so he knew the power of Austin, it. Texas. Absolutely. He, he really understood media. He looked at the BBC, and remember, at, you know, many, in many countries, public broadcasting came before commercial. In this country, it was the other way around. There was a commercial... Uh, media industry and then public broadcasting was formed, but he recognized that the marketplace was only going to be able to do so much. It would create great work. This building is filled with images of <coughs> extraordinary television that we all grew up on. 
but it, there had to be a place uh, where media was created for a different purpose. And I would argue even in this period of just massive disruption and a ton of content, uh, the work that we do on, on public broadcasting is, is singular and unique. I mean, has streaming even approached anything that you've tried to do? I mean, it, it was successfully, has there any, well, there's, has anything come up that you said, well, this one, this one could hurt us? Well, look, over the years, I've, I see things that I would have loved to have had on, on PBS. It's not, we don't own the market on great television. There is great television other places. But I, I think that um, the, um, the streamers, and actually as we now see, you know, again, a, a, a pulling back of a wide array of, of content, um, you see genres that are just really collapsing. Look at documentary film. I mean, we'll talk about Ken in a, in a minute, um, and hopefully for most of this conversation. Uh, but um, if, if you look at what's going on in documentary film, many of the places that produce documentary film, what's being bought, are largely celebrity adjacent or true crime. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's a place for lots of different things, but there are incredibly important stories that should be told. And those stories usually find their way onto PBS. And you mentioned celebrity adjacent. Uh, some of them are celebrity approved. And you've got a big problem with that, Ken. Yeah, well, I think that I've spent my entire professional life in public broadcasting. And so I just, I, I understand the huge importance of the separation of church and state, and so when I look at people who are the subjects of the films being the producers or the right. executive producers of the film, even if the film has unflattering moments, I'm really uncomfortable with that. I'm just a PBS well, child. Well, you're already always suspect. Yeah, you yeah. just wonder who said, no, don't use this. What am I not seeing is the inevitable question, and what's so... I mean, PBS is is incredibly strict. I, I had to, I was <laughs> telling Paula that I had to go twice to the essentially standards and practices to get a mention of a nonprofit that helps buy land so that Buffalo can roam um, that I also happen to have a relationship with because they named a prize in my honor. And public television is ready to say, you can't even mention them. And we finally agreed that the Buffalo didn't have a constituency or a, 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 a PAC and, in and, Washington. And they or, needed to roam. And they, need, and they needed to roam. So it's, it's in there, but I, I actually appreciated the good fight of it. I mean, we're yeah. gonna, we, we really have to put forward our bona fides. And there's, you know, there are colleagues of mine who've had to step back from things because of relationships to subject matter. I mean, that's, you know, frustrating for a filmmaker, but it's really important, particularly if you're going to call yourself public broadcasting. You know, we hear so much about political polarization in America, and PBS uh, occasionally becomes a, a, an issue in that. I mean, the, there's a very small amount of federal funding uh, that, that goes to the service, and it's, it's attacked every time uh, 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 Congress tries to cut the budget, but it doesn't seem to happen, or it hasn't happened in a while. And, and I think one of the reasons for that, uh, back home in the district of uh, Leeds Congressman, there's a, there's a local TV station, and a lo local public TV station in every town, and every person in that town can watch that local station for free if they have a TV antenna. Even if you live in a part of the country that has sketchy broadband, you can, always, you can still watch Ken Burns for free. Is this the key to maintaining uh, the service? How well, important is it? It, it's, I think it's profoundly important, and I think particularly in this era of uh, media consolidation and, and just the challenge of local media, particularly local news, um, it's important to have strong media organizations and communities. I spend a good part of my time uh, on the road. I've been to every state. I have not visited every one of our 179 licensees, 330 stations, but I've visited most of them. And in many communities I visit, they're the only local broadcasters, the TV and the public radio stations. And so I think that um, there's something very powerful about local media organizations. We're actually built upside down. You know, people think that I sit on top of this media company and I run all of these stations and actually we're like a co-op. All the stations are members of PBS. They all contribute money in. Uh, we then build a service on behalf of all of them. And I think it's really important um, to have 
and structured that way because it allows us to identify a lot of stories that I think otherwise wouldn't be well told. It's hard to find every story that deserves to be brought forward if you're only sitting in Los Angeles or, or New York or in places where a lot of media is created. And um, so the fact that we are so local, and, and you know this, most, the, almost all the money actually goes to the local stations. It doesn't actually come to us uh, of the federal money. Um, it's, I, I think legislators, for the most part, uh, recognize that it's, it's important. By the way, a lot of them actually appear on those local shows for their debates and so forth. So um, I think that that thus far, being able to uh, make the argument that it's important to have local media, that people that are writing about communities and talking about communities that live in those communities, um, it's, it's, um, it's something that legislators have understood. Plus, we, we do deep work in classroom and so forth, and so it's a, it's a whole breadth of service. But that's not to say that occasionally people don't have <laughs> other ideas. Yeah. And I know that um, tough decisions have to be made about federal appropriation. But the whole idea when this was created, again, unlike the other public broadcasters that are mostly government funded, we were created with this idea of this public-private partnership, a little bit of public money that's matched by a lot of philanthropy and, and other hard work, and that's how it's worked these many years. Ken, uh, PBS has been your home for decades now, and it's known that you've had opportunities to go elsewhere. I mean, I can imagine that Netflix probably came to you with an offer, HBO probably before that, but here you are. You're committed to PBS through the end of the decade. Uh, you're a cornerstone of the brand. Remind us why you've stayed. Well, I think without naming names, you know, it had, I have been approached at various junctures, and it, it's so interesting. I can take one period sort of post uh, the Civil War series, so the 90s, where people would came, after the sort of unexpected success of that series, people would come. That would be premium cable before the internet and before streaming uh, happened. Uh, and they would say, what are you doing next? And they said, baseball. And they would go, oh, you know, how long is it? And I said, I, I think it's 18 and a half hours. <laughs> and they, they go, no. Or when baseball, and then it had an audience that was actually bigger, not higher ratings, but bigger audience than the Civil War had had. So they're back again, sort of saying, what are you doing next? We said, jazz. And they said, oh, uh, black people's stories don't sell. And you know, at that point, you just go, bye, you know, <laughs> and 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 I, it's it, it, one of the. First of all, we shouldn't be talking, and what Paul has articulated is a model in which you are not selling, you are presenting, you are representing, you are sharing, and so that's the important thing. And so it's very simple, and why I've stayed here, and there's lots of reasons why, you know non-commercial, but you can point out that cables, premium cable and, and streaming are, are that way. The fact that every single one of the nearly 40 films that PBS has broadcast, they're my director's cut, right? And that means everything to me, right? That we, we aren't, there's not a suit telling us you can't put this in. It has, you, can you make this shorter? Can you make it longer? Can you make it more sexy? Can you make it less sexy? Can you make it more violent? Can you make it less violent? We don't have those discussions, right? And so the, the reverse engineering of that is that if you don't like any of these films, it's all my fault, right? <laughs> and I will protect the team that worked on it. But that's the satisfaction of knowing that, that you're going to tell this. And, you know, I was just speaking to someone earlier in the lobby that, that we have an honorable tradition in documentary that dates back to the very beginning of advocating for something. Like, you know, this is built in, in, in Paley who ran CBS. Um, the harvest of shame in the early 60s about migrant workers in the Central Valley of California is one of the most important and influential documentaries, a white paper, they called it back then. We have lots of um, moments where we have yielded our attention and understood about a contemporary problem through a documentary that was advocating something. But equally important is being able to take something and not put it into that dialectic of yes or no, good or bad, but to permit complex ideas to obtain. 
that you can see things from more than one perspective and share them all without necessarily putting your thumb on the scale. I have my own particular politics, and I suppose because nothing's objective, they end up just by the selection process. The cutting room floor is not filled with bad stuff, but good stuff that didn't fit. Um, there must be something there, but we, are, we work really hard to try to structure these films to represent a multitude of perspectives. And then people feel like that's more like life. That's more like these are narratives and stories. And narrative is really suited to this kind of variety of perspectives. They feel like this represents them, that it's not leaving their story out. And that's really important, particularly since what I work in is history. And most of history has been a top-down version, essentially presidential administrations punctuated by wars. And we've been interested, even when we deal with those presidential administrations and those wars, which we're very interested in, that we always have a bottom-up that connects us to so-called ordinary people that are engaged in this struggle. And that actually balances out. And then it's not, you know, in history, celebrity adjacent either, right? <clears throat> there are. It isn't just George Washington. There's Joseph Plum Martin, who's you know joining and leaving and rejoining um, the Patriot Army. Has Paula or any PBS chief you've worked for ever said no to you? Yeah, of course. This is a, this is <laughs> this is this is a relationship. So relationships are about compromise. If you don't do that, you find yourself in, in a completely uh, partisan environment where compromise is a bad. Of course, people say no. And I, you know, I've worked with Paula since 2006. I've known just about every president of PBS, dating back to Larry Grossman and coming forward. She's obviously been the longest. Remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, she's obviously been the longest tenured. But also, I mean, just she's going out and, and meeting her constituents and understanding who they are. And so inevitably, we are involved in negotiations, which means you never get 100% of what you want, which is really important, except when it comes to content. Like, she's never been to a screening of a thing where we've gone through it and we've asked her for notes, yeah. right? Or said, you know, I think it should be this way, or mm -hmm. whatever. And usually, I, you know, I learned just recently that, as I do, you know, wedded to broadcast, I have never accepted an invitation to do anything when any of my films are being broadcast for the first time, and I am watching them just every second and trying to see it completely new, not to learn tricks, but to watch when everyone else is, which is the great gift of broadcast television. And it turns out sometimes Paul is seeing my work for the very first time, for the very first time, short of a clip reel out on the road when we're promoting it. And that that's thrills me. Well, let's talk about that thrill. Because you know, when I first started covering television, when I was a wee lad, the big story was how cable was cutting into the share of the big three networks, or big four networks uh, every year. And the fall TV season would start. And then uh, uh, after a few, everything would you know, be down from what it was the year before. Uh, because it was just a matter of, of, of math. There were more choices and, and you know, more people would chip away at that big number that the networks had. And uh, in 19, uh, so you would always get a rationale as to why the ratings were, were, were down from a year ago. And in 1990, when the Civil War was on, that last week in September of 1990, mm -hmm. right in the thick of premiere week after the networks have spent millions to promote these shows, <laughs> yeah. uh, that became, Ken became the excuse that year for the reason ratings were off in the, in the fall launch. I can uh, tell you that I was in the bar of the Warwick, which BlackRock, CBS's headquarters, used. And some guy noticed me there, and, 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 and totally kidding, he said, we hate you. Because <laughs> in actually, in some, in some major markets, the Civil War had out, out, outrated all of the other three networks. I completely believe it. Yeah. Come on. But you know, that, that kind of speaks to that collective experience of appointment television, and we're losing it. Yeah. We are. Outside of NFL football, I mean, we're just not having these big shared moments through TV. So uh, does that pose a challenge for you as a storyteller today? Uh, and can another Ken Burns come along 10 years from now and have the same impact that you do? 
Yeah, I, I, you know, it's not something that I worry about. I, I worry about whether the film's good. And I want to know at the end of the day, and it sounds cliched that I've made a film or films, and I'm invariably, idiotically working on five or six at once, that I've made it better. And that's all I care about. And then I think as you begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel that, oh, this story that we're telling might work out, then you begin to consider first the educational outreach, how long it lives in classrooms. And today's the school day in America, and that Civil War series 33 plus years ago is being shown hundreds of times today as it was yesterday and the day and tomorrow. That's really great, and that's not just the only title. You know, it's Lewis and Clark, and Spaceball, and it's jazz, and it's U.S. and the Holocaust, and country music, and the Roosevelts. I mean, just about everything is in a kind of constant rotation. And then you wonder, how do you maximize the number of people who are going to see it? And I think that we have begun to understand the realities and accepted the fact that um, there, are, there is not as large a broadcast footprint that you can't, I mean, I remember after the Civil War, this middle-aged brother and sister came up to me and said, we have to tell you, our mother's 82 and she goes to bed every night at seven o'clock. But we found out about midweek, she was staying up to watch the Civil War and they said, mom, you know, we'll tape it for you and we'll let you do it. She goes, no, I wanna watch when everyone else is. And I think just as we wanna sing the national anthem uh, at a ball a ga game together, or we want to sing in choir, or we want to do things collectively, that won't end. The exigencies of, of television right now are changing, are you suggesting, but we're looking for ways to aggregate, however they're going to be, enough people. I, I'm sad, you know, when people talk about social media, social media isn't. It's antisocial. It isn't, of course. You ever been in a room with teenagers and they're all on their phone? They're not talking to one another, or maybe they are, but through the text. So there's, there's something diabolically insidious about that sort of thing. But we now have so many options that people are going to now, who, who couldn't watch because they weren't free, taking care of kids or getting home from work or whatever, now have the ability to stream it. You know, and so there's added benefits. Of, so for me, as a, I don't think it has in any way limited. Look, I mean, I'll tell you that when the Telegraph came out, people said, this is the end of letter writing. When the Civil War came out, all of the critics at TCA, the Television Critics Association meeting, is at the Century Plaza Hotel said, Ken, this is really good. No one's going to watch it. Everybody's attention is ruined by MTV and, and a two and a half minute music video. And besides, Stephen Bochco has a new police procedural <laughs> in which they sing, and no one's going to watch this. And so what I, I think we learn in PBS is that all meaning accrues in duration, right? And that we're I'm, willing I'm to glad, be. I'm just, only a paley audience will laugh at cop rock jokes, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's good I don't want to take it out on Stephen Bochco. I, I appreciate the historical perspective that you, you know, but, but yeah. Stephen Bochco is a, you know, a super, super great, and that one, didn't work. No. But you know, we we are we are the tortoise in the tortoise and the hare, hare story, right? We do not have all of the bells and whistles, nor the re resources to send the fireworks up in the sky. But we we kind of tread along, and we it's funny this kind of underfunded, one foot in the marketplace, the other defiantly and proudly out produces the best science, the best nature, the best drama, the best public affairs. That's children's, that's really unbelievable. And when you look at the work that Ken does, um, you know, many times, particularly for the, the big series, but even the smaller ones, he'll take months, and in some cases with the really big projects, as much as a year ahead of time, and travels around the country Sometimes some of the historians and other people engaged with them take pieces of the film. And this comes back to our stations again. We have all these storefronts across the country. And I think this is a moment when people are really hungering to be together and have conversation. I mean, you're physically here. You're not sitting looking into a screen watching this. Why are you in this room? Because you want to hear an extraordinary storyteller, but you also want to be together. And I think that to be able to continue to do what Ken has done so beautifully with, with his films, and it used to be we'd build up to the broadcast and then we'd sort of move on, but now 
because there are opportunities for people to continue to see these programs as they're streamed, it creates a much bigger, I think, longer term potential. It's different. It's different than what you would call the water cooler conversation of did you just see that? But oftentimes, I mean, you know this yourself, friends will talk about something fantastic they've seen somewhere. And then first you have to figure out where they saw it and sort of track it down. But it, it's, it's a different experience not being able to have the collective. I mean, that's why I watch it. I mean, I don't want you to think that I don't watch any of Ken's films before they get on the air and suddenly it's magic. It's like, we hope it's going to work. That's not the case. People do look at his work before it airs. But I like the fact that I'm sitting in my living room and watching while lots of other people are watching. I like the fact that I still have people in my life that I can then talk to about it. But I also like the fact that the first time we experimented with, and believe me, talking Ken into streaming his programs <laughs> was painful. Um, Did you resist? What? Well, he wasn't quite sure. He it, wasn't, I just didn't, I didn't, I missed, the whole thing that we're talking about now seems sort of naively sentimental and romantic Quaint. about that. But it, at it the is time, a little I wanted to hang on to the idea of just a broadcast footprint because that's, that's what where, that's what I knew. Yeah. And in fact, most of his big series all broadcast in the fall because it went back to the Civil War. Now I'm telling you something that maybe seems obvious, but it's worked. It happens to be a time of year that, you know, you come off the, su the summer, people are sort of settling down and focusing on things as work. It's conditioning. And it's conditioning. But, and, and maybe it's also luck. It's like wearing the lucky socks. You know, it worked the first time, so let's do it again. But with um, the Roosevelt's, right. which was the first project, we talked him into allowing us to drop the entire series on the first night on streaming. And so, and we watched the numbers, and it was so interesting because what happened was there was a big audience for the first night. If that had gotten messed up, I, you know, I would be like working somewhere else right now. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but what happened was you could see where people were coming into the streams. And some of them were moving back into broadcast. They were like catching up with their friends. So like the first, the first night the streams were some, and there were, there were crazy people that watched the entire thing. You know, in the first, how many hours was Roosevelt's? 15. Yeah. 14, 15. Yeah. So there, was, there, was, there were crazy people that did watch the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> but then you saw that people were hearing about it, so they'd catch up and they would join the broadcast, or they would fall out like the woman that couldn't stay up at night and come back in. And it just allowed us to really expand. And then as we continued to move forward, we would talk about different ways that we would showcase it. But you look at films over the years that, you know, I mean, I love th talking about the Civil War, because I talk to kids that talk to me about this great new show they've seen on the Civil War. And they think that it was made yesterday. Yesterday. And so, I mean, these projects are so powerful and the storytelling is so extraordinary that what, as, as, as much as we miss the fact that everyone was forced at eight o'clock to sit down and watch something together, the opportunity to create these other opportunities to meet people where they are, I think ultimately creates much more experiences. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I also think there's an important thing, just as I was told that it's MTV that it eroded our attention span, and then nobody was gonna watch the Civil War, but then no one was gonna watch baseball for the same reason. No one was going to watch jazz. No one was going to watch the war now because there was YouTube and there were kittens with balls of yarn, and that was had replaced the MTV. And don't forget music. watermelons with rubber bands. And yeah. exactly, and then the same thing with national parks, but didn't happen with the Roosevelts. No. And it didn't happen with the Roosevelts because everybody started realizing there is so many options that what do we knew? What's the the verb that we use now is binging. Binging is looking at, a, they're telling me, you can't do these, nobody has the attention span. Well, that's all people have, is their attention span. Mm -hmm. And all meaning, as I said, a cruise in duration. So kittens with balls of yarn are fine. Empty video, videos are fine. That's people have been diverted for as long as there have been people. But the reason why we are people is because we do things in duration. And the way we curate the tsunami of stuff coming at us, the millions you know, of 
of internet impressions and the hundreds of cable and the broadcast options is because we curate and we curate in duration. You know, I've got, I've got a 13-year-old who is supposed to be in the sweet spot of no attention. All she wants me to do is to watch season after season of one show, you know, that she thinks that I should see. And so we now have the ability to dial up a show I missed, you know, that ran for 10 seasons and just 23, 26 episodes a season, watch it together. I mean, that, it doesn't have that holding hand sense that watching, that doing the broadcast. But that's what we're, she and I are doing. But the other thing also that I think is important as, you're, as you really think about on demand, when you think about our content, because we were talking about this in the hallway, actually we're in the stairwell outside. That's, that's a really interesting place to stand and wait to hear your name. We're, that's a stairwell. But, um, but the thing that's really interesting, you said it's not like you can you know, watch Ken's work and be doing other things. You really have to focus on it. And some of the work he produces is so rich and so full of material and I'm thinking particularly of Vietnam. Now, I was a child during the Vietnam War, and I had a child's perspective of what happened. And it, is, um, it was very much a formative part of my life. And to be able to watch that and feel that I could stop and go back and think about it is, is again, really powerful. I mean, you could go out and buy the DVDs and do the same thing, but to be able to offer that up to anyone, free, um, that wants to be able to stream this content and to see it and to think about it, I think is also a great benefit for the kind of storytelling that Ken does. And you know, you, you, so we're, you, Taking you off all how, your questions. No, now. no, no, no. You, <laughs> me, you mentioned how, how the Civil War is, you know, is, still, is still shown in schools today. And, and that kind of plays to the original mission of, of PBS, as you pointed out. It started out as national educational television. Yep. Um, and you've held on to that legacy. And I've got to believe that with budget cuts at schools, greater emphasis on STEM, less emphasis on history, there's an opportunity here, perhaps uh, responsibility or urgency to step it up, right? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, we started out as educational television. Uh, many of our stations have E's in their call letters, including WNET. That's what the E stands for. Um, station in Washington that brings uh, Ken's work, WETA. The E stands for education. And so this idea that we were like classrooms of the air, we, we came back to that during COVID. And uh, a lot of our stations began running educational programming. Being able to deliver content into classrooms via broadband has created huge opportunities and not, you know, um, not full series, although some, station, uh, some teachers do that, uh, but also to take smaller pieces and to offer that up is, is tremendously important. I think we're living through a period where we see the consequence of history being diminished in school. And I, you know, we do a lot of work in science and STEM and other things. And I feel we just had a board meeting last week. I actually, by the way, have to call out two board members who are sitting here. Larry Irving is the chairman of our board, is sitting in the front row, who I didn't know was coming. And I'm embarrassed I didn't invite because I didn't think you were going to be in New York. I didn't want you to feel like you had to come. I'm sorry. And, uh, and Jeff Sands, who's also on our board. And we just had a long conversation about this, the fact that this does feel like a moment that two areas that used to be core in curriculum, both civics and history, um, have been sort of pushed aside with a focus on, on STEM and, and other subjects. And our democracy hangs on the fact that people are informed citizens. And part of that is the work that this dear man does in helping us understand where we came from. And so, I think for our classroom work, it's profoundly important. But I think for the rest of us, it's profoundly important because we do also have a generation that have moved past school that we have an opportunity to reach if we have powerful stories that we tell well. And because we have digital platforms and we can put all that stuff out there, it creates a real opportunity. But you know, Ken, with, with history is, is being, what's being taught, is the history is being taught or what's being taught is under attack. And it's happening on a local level 
with, and with so little resources, resources for local news and smaller communities, much of this is happening outside of a national spotlight. We don't feel like we're on a great path here. Uh, is there anything that historians or filmmakers can do to combat, the, combat this? Uh, you know, is there, what options do you have? Well, I think there are all the options that Paula just enumerated. You just have to tell good stories. That's it. I mean, we are in a period where we are so preoccupied with the dialectic, that with the political, which is just, you know, sees everything in a binary fashion. And there's nothing binary in the universe. And so being able to contain these complex stories provides people with something that's realistic. It just rings a bell with them, no matter what your political persuasion is, a good story is a good story, and it helps to overcome that. Um, the novelist Richard Powers said, you know, the best arguments in the world won't change a single person's point of view, and all we do is argue, right? He said the only thing that can do that is a good story. So if you, if you tell good stories, you have that opportunity to reverse that, or at least provide an oasis in the midst of the wasteland of that just, you know, the tennis game, the back and forth, the dialectic. To, to, to tell complicated stories. There was a moment in our jazz series where Wynton Marcellus said to us, sometimes a thing and the opposite of a thing are true at the same time. And if you can hold that, which everyone has to do in their lives in a daily basis, you know, in relationships with children, in work, all of those things obtain. And that's the element actually of a good story, where things are not as simple as they may seem or you, or you may want them to be. And one of the great um, bulwarks against what is the severe test right now of our republic is the ability to comprehend and to tolerate complex stories and not allow them to become prisoners of the partisan moment. So you have to just continue to do that. I mean, Jefferson said in the, in the Declaration, um, all experience has shown that mankind are disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable. What he means is that everybody's been under an authoritarian rule until just now. Wow. And that this new, by, I think by extension, he's meaning that this thing that Paula just brought up, being a citizen, is really the highest office of the land, right? That's the highest office. And before we were subjects, and so, when you see the tendency of this selective process that's going on, it's an attempt to return us to a subjecthood. Citizens are informed, and citizenry is a kind of active verb. To be a subject is completely passive. And in fact, what's worse is to be the superstitious, uh, conspiracy-filled peasant that most of humanity has spent most of their time being. And so we have an opportunity, particularly in this country, which invented these ideas. However, misguided many of the founders were in its application and how still we haven't worked it out, we nonetheless have a blueprint for what that responsible citizenry is. And part of that is, for me, a no-brainer to stay in public broadcasting because that's where you have the opportunity to make the greatest kind of contribution to that, educationally as well as the broadcast, as well as the streaming, as well as all the other things that we do. I mean, the stations that Paul is talking about, they're not just that broadcast schedule. They're not just the children's programming in the morning and the afternoon that's going to help a single mom or a single dad you know, deal with what's going on. It's crop reports. It's homeland security. It's continuing education. It's classroom of the air. The, I mean, it doesn't sound very sexy. This is where the tortoise thing comes in. But this is hugely important to people's lives, people who are trying to better themselves, laid off. What are you going to do? Right there in, your, in, your, in that box is your, is your liberation. And so I think we're, you know, we're, you know, we used to say of the national parks that they, they were the Declaration of Independence applied to the landscape. Public television is the Declaration of Independence applied to communication. So, you know, I kind of, I've heard you talk about the hate mail you received after this, when the Civil War came out, and much of it very racist, ugly, but there's a big difference. Back then, it was mail. Yeah. It was brought to you by a postal worker. Yeah. And aside from you talking about it, nobody really had to see it. Uh, the, but the barrier of entry for today's critics doesn't exist, really. It's, ex it's extremely low. 
people don't like something, they will let you know on social media, and then it will become a topic on other stories. And let me tell you that working in a newspaper in 2023, I can tell you every newspaper in the digital era, they have what they call an audience engagement editor. And they are looking at what's trending on X and Instagram and Facebook all day, and they suggest stories based on that. And I can guarantee you, if the Civil War came out today, myself and others would be writing stories about the blowback, whatever it was. How do you think that program, and you as a filmmaker, would have fared under that kind of scrutiny with, with, that, with that story? It's interesting. Um, it's a really, really good question, and it speaks to the sort of painful realities of today. And, and yes, it, I mean, it didn't stop at the Civil War. It increased with baseball and increased with jazz. And the central story is that you know, you cannot scratch the surface of American history without talking about um, black people, you know? And if you do, that makes a lot of people upset. And um, that's all we do, in a way, uh, or Native Americans or women. And so you engender a lot of that response. For me, it's a little bit easier than opening the mail used to be because I just don't, I don't participate in any of that. It, life is way too short to, to begin to feel the troll. I mean, we created, Paul has looked over here, and two of our, our, our producers and directors are here, Sarah Burns and Sarah Botstein. I only brought the Sarahs today. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we, we used to have to digest that, and, and they know, I, I just don't pay any attention. We started a war room for Vietnam, right. and everybody had cobwebs because the story was so compelling and provided so many different points of view. We had people in there who felt we should still be in Vietnam fighting the commies, and we had people who were deserters, who left the United States and renounced their citizenship. And not only that, we had North Vietnamese civilians and soldiers and Viet Cong um, soldiers and South Vietnamese civilians and so and every range of Americans in between those two polarities. And so people were, I don't think disarmed is the right way, but a, a lot of that dialectic just shuts down in the face of a, of a complicated story in which to follow that story, you actually have to let go of some of those impulses. So of course, I've heard, we're trolled in the extreme left and the extreme right, but you know, that vast middle, which own, is the only place that matters, huge, and it crosses both you know, the partisan divide, were stunned by what they were learning about this. And that was the important. Well, lesson. I mean, are, are you prepared for what might come down when we see you do the American Revolution? Yeah, I mean, you, you look at the right wing, they throw, they throw around the, the term founding fathers an awful lot, and I'm, I'm sure they're probably gonna hear a few things that they're not gonna like. When yeah, this there's when not a this lot program. to, I mean, look, it, we call balls and strikes, and, and there's not, a, you know, there's a wonderful moment in our revolution film that's coming out in two years, and we've been working on it for six, and it's like, um, the, there is an African American historian who at one point in our film, and, and I'll tell you, George, George Washington, it's, it's covering everything, Native Americans, and freed blacks, and enslaved Americans, and Germans, and, immigrants and women, and it's just finally telling a much more complex story of it. But if you said, who's the major character? I go, George Washington. <laughs> and he's got lots of problems, right? But even this scholar said, he goes, he shakes his head. It's the only time really in the film where somebody breaks the fourth wall and just says, you know, I, I, I really don't believe in the great man theory, but I, I don't really know how we would be together without him. All right? So you can be waiting in bated breath to catch me at what, you know, whatever you think is some violation of the, of the code of the perfection of the Founding Fathers, but that's a really good moment to have and to be reminded. This is a person with enormous undertow, right? Enormous undertow and huge defects and loses almost every battle he's engaged in except the last one, <laughs> right? <It mattered. laughs> and, and that was a really important thing. And, you know, and we're here because of that. We're here because of that. And it's, you have to, to understand that. But I would also say that our image, and let me just throw out, because I, I've, I've now done the celebrity adjacent person. 
the idea of the sturdy militiamen is wonderful to play up, but they run away to plant crops, and they run away to harvest crops, and they run away because they're scared. And what ends up winning the war is the Continental Army, which is made up of recent immigrants from Ireland and Germany, and uh, ex-convicts, and teenagers, and um, second and third sons who don't stand in line for inheritance, and freed blacks, and runaway enslaved people, and Native American tribes, the minority that fought with us as opposed to the majority that fought with the British. And so there's a really complicated dynamic, and there's something really wonderful that the people who won the war look exactly like America now. And the story we've told of 55 white guys in Philadelphia, and by the way, that's the Constitutional Convention years after the war was over, is just not true from the very beginning. It's as, as diverse a continent as you could possibly imagine, and the idea that we'd figure out some way, however haphazardly and, and, and improbably, and with tragic compromises to cohere, is a wonderful story to tell. We have gotta wait two years for this? When is this coming out? <laughs> you, you, you can come up, I'll show you some stuff. <laughs> Damn. From Ken's 2001 series, Jazz, and which, and, uh, I forgot. In, in preparing for this, it, 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 I really learned how this is, this is sort of a testament to, to two things. First of all, the durability of, of Ken's work. I mean, it, it, this is something that's over 20 years old, and the, the tone, the language, the sweep, not dated one nanosecond. I mean, it, it, the, the, the freshness of it is, is amazing. And it also demonstrated the utility of, of PBS Passport. Uh, which I gather you, which is available, I guess, to all members now. This is the fundraising moment of the evening. <laughs> Everybody so I, gets a tote bag well, at the I, end. I, 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 this, I, this is an absolute. I do hope you're all members I, of the no, Paley no, Center you, and members of WNET. Forget so. the umbrellas and tote bags. This is the reason now to to to, yeah. to give yeah. to PBS because yeah. it, it it is a chance to get acquainted and reacquainted with yeah. this work. I mean, and um, over the the ten episodes of Jazz. Louis Armstrong, he, he's like a character in a novel, really. I mean, he's introduced at the end of that first episode, and amid and at the, at the beginning of the century, and then amid all the changes throughout the 20th century, he's there, and he always matters. And it's in that final episode of Jazz, there's that amazing segment about, in the, in the midst of the Beatles, dominating the charts in 1964, Beatlemania, and this is a time when a lot of jazz musicians had to go to Europe because they couldn't find an audience here, there was no market here anymore for them. Uh, Louis Armstrong hits number one on the Billboard charts with Hello, Dolly. I mean, it was just, it's just an incredible, it tells a story about the culture of the moment, but then we don't lose that human side either because the rest of that episode spoke to the resilience and the, and the durability of Armstrong, who was, was touring and performing until the day he died. And, you know, he, he does so much heavy lifting for you in that show. Tell me about the process of identifying a figure like that. Well, that take it, and really drive the, all the points that you want to make. I was asked once by President Obama what that who I'd have dinner with from the past. Everybody assumes it would be Lincoln. It'd be Louis Armstrong. Uh, b barbecue uh, in the backyard and at the house in Queens. Yeah, I mean, maybe with a few members of the 1969 I, I New York Mets. I uh, cannot <laughs> begin to tell you. He is the most important person in music. I did not say jazz mm -hmm. in the in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. He he is to music. I did not say jazz. What Einstein is to physics, what Freud is to medicine, and what the Wright brothers are to travel. I cannot describe it any way. He took this ensemble music and turned it into a soloist art. He invented, for lack of a better word, modern time, playing before or after the note, what we call swing, which was originally called orchestrated Armstrong. When Louis Armstrong uh, was playing in Times Square and um, uh, Duke Ellington saw him. He said, I want Louis Armstrong on every single instrument. And he spent the next 50 years creating an orchestra that had not just virtuoso performers, but virtuoso personalities. People in jazz, uh, the, one of the prime movers, if not the prime mover, Dizzy Gillespie of Bebop with Charlie Parker said, know him, know me. He is at the center of, of everything. And I, you know, somebody told me, that uh, nobody agrees in jazz about anything, right? They argue about everything except that Armstrong is a gift from God. 
And I once told this to a woman who, for lack of a better word, I guess, is a psychic, and she just looked at me and beamed, closed her eyes, and said, biggest wings I've ever seen. You, there, I, there's no one more important than Louis Armstrong in American history. He is so central, and he comes down to us in some ways, unfortunately, because of Hello, Dolly, in It's a Wonderful World, a guy with a handkerchief, mm -hmm. and big uh, uh, you know, smile and whatever. But to understand how revolutionary he is, much more than Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, is what he did with West End Blues, or the kinds of transformations that he made. And then he did the same thing for singing. And if we had Frank Sinatra here, or Billie Holiday, or Mick Jagger, or anybody, they would tell you he is at the heart of it. And I spoke to Tony Bennett, who only recently passed away, and he would, they would all say, Pops, that's where you understood how to sing. Everybody, Ella Fitzgerald, everyone would say that. And I cannot say enough about Louis Armstrong. And so that story, that clip, is what we look for. It's the, it's the, um, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts, and it really focuses on Charlie Black. It's all about Louis Armstrong. That is to say, this, this kid, 16-year-old kid, was woken up and transformed by an artist into changing his life and doing something that made our country better. And that's why he's the biggest wings. And when you see some of Ken's other work in country music, I mean, you have, those, you have these other sort of historical moments colliding with each other. You know, I mean, I, I was looking at an episode uh, the, the other night, and, uh, and you, you're talking about Loretta Lynn, and then all of a sudden there's a, there's a still of, of Betty Friedan at the height of the women's movement, and it's uh, really talking about how those were really feminist anthems yeah. that, that Look, Loretta I Lynn was writing. Look, I tell you that uh, Grace Slick was not singing Don't Come Home, uh, Drinking With Lovin' On Your Mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Loretta Lynn said that. And Loretta Lynn and wrote the film, a thing about taking the pill, which was just like, it was like people went crazy, you can't say this. Wouldn't release was, it for two years. Wouldn't release it for two years. I mean, Loretta Lynn is so incredible. And I think what we do is, I mean, one of the things that we wanted to do country was just to show that how, you know, commerce and convenience in silos music and says it's separate. Everybody's listening to everything. Everybody's listening to everything, and everything's being influenced. And the notion now that we can take this music, which popularly at this moment is white and southern and conservative, but has been everywhere, and is done, and it is a very simple, almost like haiku, you know, three chords and the truth. There are, there are some lyrics, you know, by um, Hank Williams or Merle Haggard or Johnny Cash that are as fine a poetry as anything we've ever had. And it's really important to tell all of those stories. A bit of a, a personal question here, because you've talked about this, the, the, the death of your mother at age 12 and how you decided to become a filmmaker shortly after that when you saw, you were, went to a movie with your father and saw him cry, saw how he was moved. And I want to know, did, did that, that's such a tra traumatic experience. Did it give you a, a deeper understanding of the past and maybe even deeper understanding of history? Because there is something that's so important in your life that is over, that is history, so to speak. Did that make you understand history better, more profoundly? I don't know. I grew up kind of interested in history. I noticed that most people read novels, and I sort of read encyclopedias and histories and <laughs> things like that. You know, I didn't have a childhood. She died when I was 11, and this was when I was 12, a few months. I'd never seen my dad cry, not when she was sick, not when she died, not at her incredibly sad funeral. And I, when I saw him, I understood immediately. We were at home. He let me stay up at night till 1 a.m., you know, with all the ads, you know, for a movie. And this one was Odd Man Out by Sir Carol Reed with James Mason about the Irish troubles of the teens in the 20s of the, uh, of the 20th century. And... Um, I vowed right there, and that meant Alfred Hitchcock, you know, John Ford, Howard Hawks, who were the great American directors at that time. Um, I went to Hampshire College, and everybody was social documentary still photographers and filmmakers, and that really changed me uh, completely. And then history was just untutored and untrained and came in and merged by the time I was 22. I feel very lucky that that early age 
that I've been able to do what I'm supposed to be doing. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. But much later on, um, my late father-in-law uh, said, look what you do for a living. You wake the dead. You make Abraham Lincoln and Jackie Robinson come alive. Who do you think you really want to wake up? And so I think when I was typing out these letters before there were even selectric self-correcting typewriters, you were using tape or tearing it up and doing it all over again, we're trying to raise money for the Brooklyn Bridge film, the first one that PBS showed. I said, at some point I was, I said that I thought that I was an emotional archeologist, not interested in just excavating the dry dates and facts and events of the past, but an emotional archeologist that might meld it. I didn't know what I was saying and it would take a few decades to sort of begin to understand that I think, and it's probably true for all of us here, loss and difficult times have been more animating and more formative than smooth sailing. Well, I was gonna ask you that. I mean, does a loss like that at, at, at that age, does it give you a, a single-mindedness to, to create, to, to say something? To... Not that I was conscious of. I, I guess in hindsight, I could probably say this. I once asked Walker Percy why, this, why the South produced so many great writers, and he stood up to his full six foot three stature, looked down at me and went, because we lost. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Fantastic. He'd, he'd, be, he'd be horrified to learn that, that um, that they didn't lose and that mm. the Confederate Army never disbanded. Uh, we're coming up on a big election year, 2024. Cable news, which I watch a lot of my job, has become very tribal. People, audiences are looking for affirmation, not information. Younger people certainly aren't watching it. Paul, I wanna ask you, if this, is this an opportunity for PBS, I mean, and how, what are your plans to, to meet it? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say opportunity. I would, if I was a commercial uh, executive, I would say opportunity, I would say obligation. I, I think that, you know, I look at the various aspects of our work. Um, you know, it's profoundly important the work that we do for very young children. It's profoundly important the work that we do to bring history to life, particularly I think context is important. Uh, but the work that our producing colleagues at the News Hour and Frontline and others bring forward is so critically important. You know, it's interesting. I think sometimes people make assumptions about uh, PBS who watches. People across the country watch. Um, when I try, again, I can't emphasize um, the gift it has been uh, for me to be able to travel around the country and spend time to, with people in communities across the country and actually listen to what are the things that they're concerned about and worried about. And people watch us for fact. Um, as Ken described, I think, beautifully in, in documentary storytelling, a work in news isn't to tell you what to think. There is a lot of places you could go for that. And I think one of the great challenges of our time is people tend to, to gravitate towards places where they'll hear their own opinions reflected back. Our job is not to do that. Our job is to just give you the information. You make up your own mind. And I seem but, to recall you telling me that, that the, the red state, blue state split is pretty even for, uh, for your, well, your, not just, your news program. Not just the state, but you know, we actually we look carefully at our audiences to try to understand who are we reaching. And if you look at a series like NewsHour, Frontline both, actually, their audiences are very similar. They break down 30, 30, 30, 10. 30% 30 of the viewers identify as being conservative, 30% identify as being more progressive, 30% are in the middle, and 10% are not gonna tell you what they, what they are. And don't if, don't and, know. Yeah. yeah. No, I think they're not going to tell you what they are. Um, and I think that if you're if you're if you're hitting that mark, that's really important. I also think, uh, again, reflecting back on the contributions that Ken and others make, you know, Frontline did a film, uh, I think, maybe in 2000 or 2001, called Shattered Dreams about Israel. In the last month and a half. That film, which is streaming on YouTube, has gotten 2.8 million views. And I think people are trying to really understand. And there are plenty of people that have their minds made up and think they know history. And I think we really need to understand. And I think that these are services that 
that we provide. So as we look towards the election, a few things. One is I think we're gonna rely very heavily on our programs. We are also, um, you know, Frontline always does the choice. Um, we are, our stations are very focused on what they can be doing locally as well, uh, because we all tend to f follow the national election, but there are decisions being made across the country that have profound implications. Our job is to make sure that people have information so they can be citizens. You know, when you said we don't tell people what to think, we tell people to think. Correct. And that's a big deal. And also, just please remember, because I get this a lot, I've testified at least 10 times in Congress over the funding issue for the, over the last 30 years, less so recently, believe it or not. And um, William F. Buckley's firing line was mm -hmm. on for decades, mm -hmm. for decades. Now taken over by Margaret Hoover, airing on Friday nights. So I think that it, it is important um, to ensure that we're bringing lots of perspectives forward. And then, you know, you have the information, you make up your own mind what you think. So Ken, one of your upcoming projects, LBJ and the Great Society, and I have to believe that uh, lining up interviews for this is driving your actuary uh, crazy because... Uh... <laughs> no, we actually consulted our actuary uh, right away, and we've worked our way over the last several years down those actuarial tables. <laughs> it's the only way to conduct films in which you might have living witnesses. But, but I mean, were there a lot of people left? Because yes. I mean, did, did, oh, uh, yes. Uh, and why did it take so long to, to get to this? Because this, because this, is, this well, is so in your wheelhouse. You, a lot of films grow out of films we've done, right? So the most recent film on the Buffalo grew out of working on the West and then Lewis and Clark and then the National Parks. And we sort of talked about it. And some films, you, you know, you say country music and you're working on it the next day. And some films like Buffalo takes 30 years and you go, now's the time uh, to do it. What happened with LBJ is that he's the most interesting. I mean, there are two Shakespearean characters at the heart of the Vietnam story of the celebrity adjacent type being LBJ and Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon isn't garden variety. He's really, really complicated and very, very interesting. But LBJ is more so. He had a, 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 a very, as Paulus led off with, he had an incredibly ambitious agenda. He wanted to be like his mentor, FDR. And he's still got the second greatest legislative accomplishments of anyone after, L, after uh, FDR. And so in our Vietnam film, we have this beautiful se uh, sentence written by our longtime writer, Jeff Ward, who wrote the Civil War, wrote baseball, wrote jazz, wrote prohibition, wrote the Holocaust, is writing the revolution, um, in which he we talk about his domestic agenda and we pull out from a picture of FDR to reveal LBJ staring at it in admiration in the White House. But that's it. The rest of it is just this foreign policy disaster. And so it's, I wanted, I wanted to do a film that kind of reversed the angle, kind of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. I wanted to be in the White House with this ambitious domestic agenda and have the guns outside get louder and louder that begin to threaten it. So it's called LBJ and the Great Society because it's really important to understand. Now, I walked out of a rally in New Hampshire in which President Obama had just, was in the process of passing or had just passed uh, the ACA and there was huge protests outside. And, one guy was yelling at me, and I had my uh, little girl with me who was six or seven, and I said, please don't yell. And it, it, something in his sign, I said, you know that Medicare is a government program. And he said, no, it's not. I and so this. I just, uh, that was, oh I, just I, I realized, you know, I, I can never run out of stories in American history. <laughs> <laughs> No, there were signs that said, keep your hands off my Medicare. Yeah, yeah no, and it's really, that's what he had thought, that somehow the ACA was a government program that was going to somehow alter his relationship with this thing which he liked called <laughs> Medicare, not to mention the thing he liked called Medicaid, not to mention the thing he liked called Social Security, not to mention all of the other things. You know, maybe he's being paid every January 1st not to plant something, you know part of the great welfare sure. state, though we never talk about that. And so there's a, um, there's a wonderful opportunity 
because we're still relatively young and we tend not to be curious. People, the older you get, the more interested in those memories and the histories. We were talking about it up, upstairs, just about what Christmas means now. And this ornament comes from this generation and this person. We're connected in that intimate way. And so I think if you engage a history, an emotional archaeology that does that, then you have an opportunity to sort of <coughs> allow the past to be the invaluable teacher that it is. I mean, there is, Harry Truman, I, I think, is supposed to have said, there's nothing more new than the history you don't know. And there's something really wonderful about that, you know, because it is such an extraordinary teacher. I want, we're, we're running short on time. I, I want to uh, just, just try to get a, a question or two here for, that came in from members. Um, and I imagine this has been kind of a moving target lately. How many researchers, producers, and archivists does it take to produce a documentary series? It's so tiny, it would really, really shock you. Um, a big project like the American Revolution or Vietnam it, you know, our credits will quite rightfully thank, you know, a couple hundred people, but the nucleus of the people who made it, that means the directors or director, the producers, the co-producers, the editors, their assistants, are maybe 15 or 16 people at the heart of it. And that means we're all doing it. We're all reading, we're all visiting stuff. There are people who are focusing on finding the photographs or finding the newsreels or both or finding in the case of the revolution which has no um, I came to the Paley Center early to see if they have any photographs or newsreels from the revolution and they don't and so we're, we're really you know having to struggle to find new ways to tell the story um, but you know we're we it's an intimate group because you you the presumption is is there's a legion, but you know if you think about that archive that has a thousand photographs of the Civil War, do you really want to send somebody who's make it going to you know we're they're going to make xeroxes of six hundred of them, and we're going to end up filming three hundred of them, but I'm going to spend the rest of my life wondering what are the other seven hundred, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, for example, I physically shot all the photographs in the paper print collection of the Library of Congress. The, what is called the Matthew Brady collection, meaning him and his photographers. It's thousands and thousands of photographs, which I hand shot myself and hand said yes or no to. And now in, it's, it's really sad that we can't go there because somebody goes and digitizes what they think. And I still lie awake wondering what it is we don't have. And then you, know, you get into the editing and you're at the last moment and go, what else is there? And you go through this thing and you go, oh, that's so much better. And so we're, we try to keep it as intimate as possible. And it's, it's really true. Sarah, I hope both Sarahs are nodding. You know, it's pretty, pretty, you know, pretty small. Uh, we're, uh, I, I was hoping to get some, some stories about Ken's experience on, uh, on uh, Clifford's puppy days. I heard there were a lot of juicy stories on, on the set when you did that show in 2005. <laughs> but uh, we're unfortunately out of time, so thank you so much, <laughs> Ken Burns, Paula Carter. Thank you. Thank you.